Kicking off our list at number 10, dental surgery. Back in the ancient Egyptian worlds, it's not like you could just take a quick trip to the dentist to get your teeth checked out and cleaned, yada yada, and then you go home, whatever, right? The diet of the average Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, conductive to having an impeccable set of pearly whites. That's mostly due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, you know, would naturally destroy your chiclets. And through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time that have been discovered. And it's pretty horrifying, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, an ancient abscess. We love those. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. This mummy, in his first molar, was a bunch of surgically produced holes that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some, you know, very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were in fact happening all those years ago. And before we head into the rest of this list, we also have to remember that all this was done, or most of this was done, without anesthetics, right? No one's gonna put you to sleep, and then you wake up and you're like, ah, oh, my teeth are gone, what happened? No, you were awake for the whole thing. It sucked. Number nine, Egyptian stitches. Yeah, gotta talk about Egyptians once again. I'm gonna talk about them quite a bit. They're the OGs. Just in general, while surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, obviously, like I just said, no painkillers, no antibiotics, the list goes on, right? No fun. One thing that's less invasive, but still extremely important, was seen quite a bit during these times. Use of stitches. Yeah, I've never needed any in my life, thank God, knock on. Knock on wood that I don't need any stitches. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own sutures in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers or hair, or tendons, or wool threads, anything, right? In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus that came from ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described. 48, imagine being one of those 48, that's Kind of epic, not gonna lie. Number eight, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go on inside. There was, uh, yeah, a lot of bloodshed and crowds would rush the arena after the day was done. Not to get autographs, but to hopefully, hopefully get a sip of that sweet gladiator blood. Yeah, blood back then was a magical elixir. And then near the early 1500s, blood was seen as this youth juice. Yeah, you drink some young blood as an elderly, and then those knees, your patellas, would apparently start working again. A lot of theories surrounding blood back then. And in the Middle Ages, bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought your humors were out of balance. It is so hot in this goddamn In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey. That changed the game, right? Now, the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture hypothetically. That's a little odd. So we started to test this out on canines. Scientists were injecting them with different substances, and slowly but surely, that turned into blood transfusion between animals, between canines. So this is back in the 1660s, right? That's how early we started injecting things with blood. It's kind of gross. Number seven, cataract surgery. Okay, don't tell him I told you this, but Kyle, my brother Kyle, our other lovely co-host on B, is blind in one eye. Yep. Kyle was born with a cataract, but you would never know because he plays rugby amazingly and somehow he reads this tiny prompter. I can barely do it with two eyes. No idea how you do it, man, you're a champ. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book, well, rather in the painting. It was found in a tomb in ancient Egypt. It was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. They believed this was a method called couching, which happened to be recorded. See, the needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. Now, it wasn't until 1747 until Jacques Daniel, a doctor in France, he performed the first ever cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. He was the OG. Every method sounds wildly uncomfortable. Have you been through this? Like Kyle has kudos. Number six, skin treatment. As soon as summer comes around, honestly, it's game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter, right? I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did ancient Egyptians beat the heat back in ancient times? They didn't have banana breeze SPF 35. No, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. Yeah, you think your morning skin routine requires a lot of work? Buddy, read a book. Their routine was written on a tomb written on tomb walls and scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma original. Yeah, that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Ancient Greeks would use olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You're burnt and dehydrated, but also you look good, okay? Tan lines, I see you. Number five, cancer treatment. 
All right, the big C. Cancer is something that obviously very is you know very prevalent in our modern society, and because of the rising rates, it makes us ask ourselves: Did cancer exist in ancient times? If so, where was it recorded? While they didn't call it cancer, it definitely did. Some of the earliest evidence of cancer is found in ancient manuscripts. Mummies, fossilized bone tumors that have been found in ancient Egypt specifically. There are tons of examples and different forms of cancer that have been found throughout. Perhaps the oldest comes from 3000 BC. And it was found, like I said, in the Edwin Smith papyrus that we talked about before. Now in this text, it describes eight cases of tumors or ulcers of the breast and how they treated them back then, or at least tried to. See, back then these tumors were removed by cauterization using a tool called a fire drill. Other than this though, the text says in reference to the illness that there is no treatment. So in ancient times and today, we're still trying to figure this one out. Number four, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extraction, but this for sure counts as surgery. This, yeah, I've had a tooth pulled. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Every time something gets removed from your body, I'm gonna count that. And if there's definitely blood involved, yeah, I'm gonna count that. Getting a tooth pulled is still so barbaric. Even today, they don't like slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out or anything surgical. No, they just have two dentists grab your tooth at the same time, put their foot up, and then yank it out. I was numb, sure, but it was still weird, okay? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem, or well, all problems, regarding your teeth. Yeah, cavity, gone. Toothache, bleh, see ya. Oh, some plaque, no problem. <laughs> Today, we're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology, you know, to tell us if a, a tooth is coming in sideways or which ways. But back then, some believed that it was tooth worms. Yeah, this feeling over here could be a worm. Go get it checked out. Could have worms in your head. Gross. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry around 500 BC, and the way they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw aka ancient braces. Number three, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries. Trepanation was also, it was, it was the worst, it was horrible. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Let's talk about it. Turning the clocks back to thousands of years ago, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's drill some holes in our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. That'll help. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you'd first guess. The reason this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures, right? So you show up with a headache and leave with a hole in said head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is surprising, given the time. They didn't have any advanced medical instruments, but they did have sharp ones. This was the first surgical procedure, it was around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, borer to, you know, to drill. Number two, rotting whale body. Okay, not all these are not disgusting. One of the most strange things on display at the Australian National Maritime Museum exhibit has got to be the whale carcass treatment. This is an odd treatment. Now the cure for rheumatism back in the 19th century was to crawl inside of a dead whale's body and uh, yeah, just hang out for a bit. And by a bit, I mean a full 30 hours. After that point, you would definitely be healed for at least 12 months. Yeah, it began in the town of Eden, obviously a whaling town on the southern coast of Australia. Only while this was happening, it was kind of funny, the user's head would be poking out of the whale. Yeah, like the world's worst sleeping bag, all tucked in there, getting better. It all started when an intoxicated man stumbled into a dead whale body, passed out, and then when he woke up, his rheumatism was cured, just like that. Yeah, from pale ales to pale whales. No more achy joints for you, my friend, let's do it. And finally, number one. Egyptian nose job. Plastic surgery is more widespread now than it ever has been before, but it's all because it started a long time ago, especially in the ages of the ancient Egyptians. In the Edwin Smith papyrus, along with the documentation of trauma surgeries, bone fractures, fixes, and all that jazz, this text also shows examples of fixes for nasal injuries, which I gotta kinda seek. I have to seek some of that right now. I think I need to get my nose fixed. Can't breathe a lot. The treatment involved manipulating the nose into the desired position before using wooden splints or lint or swabs, anything really to hold it into place. You know, it's an ancient nose job. It's crazy, right? It's truly wild to think back about how much, you know, these people had shaped our world and lives, especially our medical world today. While so much of the civilization still remains a mystery to us, right? It's crazy how much we still know and how much we still don't know. Number 10, mummies. This should come as no surprise to anyone, but yeah, mummies. While not the first and not the last civilization to mummify their friends and family ceasing to exist, they are probably most known for it. Well, that and maybe the pyramids. The 
Pyramids are pretty cool, I guess. The process of mummifying or preserving the body was thought to be important for the soul during the afterlife. If the vessel or your body was not intact, then your soul could get lost. Therefore, if you want the pharaoh to live forever in the afterlife, then you must pickle and preserve the mighty king. I don't want my soul getting lost. Number 9. 40 Year Old's Worst Nightmare Despite my best efforts and anti-aging cream, there will come a time when I will be old. Personally, I'm not worried about putting some mileage on. That's life. However, something I am concerned about is the effects of aging. Have you ever just noticed that you ain't as limber as you used to be? You get tired easily. And if you have more than three beers, you have to lay down for three days. However, something that happens to a lot of men reaching their 40s is a little trouble in the bedroom. This was an issue in ancient Egypt, except sadly, there wasn't a messed up process to fix impotence. I know, right? That's crazy. You thought I was gonna say something weird like wrap a snake around it or something, but no. When in modern times, the cute waitress at the golf clubhouse just doesn't get your blood pumping anymore, you could reach for a small blue pill that everybody knows. Egyptians did not possess such luxuries and instead prayed for the Pisha deal to work. Dear Desert Jeebus, please make my wiener work again. Thank you. Number 8. Ahead of their time. Ancient Egyptians just may have been ahead of their time and didn't know it. The Egyptians had tons of different herbs, plants, and methods for treating all kinds of ailments. Their alchemy skill was maxed out. I never did that. However, one method they came up with may have been helping more than they thought. A porridge mixture that was boiled down that contained tetracycline, which just in case you didn't know, is known as an antibiotic. This would have been very helpful for the time, as a scrape on the knee could be the difference between living and well, not living. While this was being used, it's unsure if the Egyptians really knew why this method worked. We doubt they understood the finite details of antibiotics, and I'm not gonna stand here and pretend that I do either, because I don't. Number seven, Tales from the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> you didn't think I was gonna talk about mummies and not talk about how they make them, right? Hold on to your spittoons, this is gonna be a rough one. Okay, so we all know that when we pass on, our bodies begin to decay and break down. The Egyptians knew this, so they would have to be one step ahead if they were to have the king pickled in time for the afterlife. Well, first things first, the brains? They gotta go. They would remove the brain with a large spike and sort of just, sort of mash it up there and just, well then they drain the contents from the nose, which, that is just disgusting. Stomach, colon, and lungs, well, those won't be needed in the afterlife either, so they gotta go too. But the heart? The heart stays though. That's where the soul is. The king was then dried out with mounds of alkaline salt in the world's best beef jerky impression. Afterwards, oils were rubbed into the skin and eventually a resin was applied to aid in the linen wrap sticking to the body. Making for that distinct Tupperware brand airtight seal. The pickled king was wrapped numerous more times just to be safe and then, if he was OG enough, placed into a sarcophagus. And if you're really cool, you'll get your own room full of gold and treasures and your pet whiskers which is a cat and be mummified because well, you need him in the afterlife too. That is one heck of an undertaking process. And to be fair, it kind of worked because there have been a few mummies recovered from Egypt and they're in amazing condition, considering the age, of course. Number six, a little off the top. Okay, without the comment section oversharing here, some people have had circumcisions and some haven't. It's a part of life, okay? Just. That's how it goes. Debatable to some, but it happens. This was a common practice in ancient Egypt, claimed to be for hygiene reasons. However, there's something a little bit different about their process. See, today it happens when you're a baby. A strange man comes in the room, and he cuts what he has to cut. It's done, there it is. That's it, it's over. Egyptians waited a little longer, however, closer to the age of 12 or 13. Can you imagine just chilling in the field one day and then some strange dude grabs you and slaps you down on the table and makes a withdrawal from you to meat and veg? I talked to the chief today and he just said that's that's not it. Don't don't do that. Number 5, bloodletting. The practice of bloodletting was common all over the world, but it may have gotten its start in ancient Egypt. It's a quite simple procedure, really. Black bile out of whack. Lose some blood. Can't stop coughing and sneezing? Drain some blood. Been possessed by demons and now they curse and haunt you as they run up and down your bloodstream? Drain some blood. The question is, however, was this really helping? The short answer, no. 
no it wasn't. Besides feeling lightheaded and going pale, this didn't really achieve much. Since the days of old were filled with all kinds of other ailments that would easily end someone's life before the spooky demons running up and down someone's bloodstream ever would. I don't feel good. Oh, we better bleed grandpa again. I don't know. Like what? Number four, plastic surgery. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a little cosmetic surgery. I for one feel that if it'll make you feel better, go for it. Feel better about yourself. Do it. I don't think there's any shame in that. It's been around for a long time, so long that ancient Egyptians might have come up with the first nose jobs. Obviously not like the ones today, but they were knowledgeable in surgeries. After all, you open the chest cavity of a dozen kings and you jot some stuff down on some papyrus, you learn a thing or two. More interesting than shaving down your own beak, however, was their implementation of the prosthesis limbs. Yes, all the way back then. One mummy was actually found with a fake toe. When tested in the modern day with period accurate sandals, it proved to work quite well and move more efficiently than first thought. Again, for the time, this was pretty advanced. Number three, the Ode of the Nile. Imagine people working all day in the blistering sands of Egypt, where the sun beams down on you like well, the sun in the desert, lifting massive rocks and carving them to shape. I don't know about you guys, but I would be sweating. And that also means I wouldn't be smelling too fresh, resembling that of a high school locker room. Yuck. Well, the Egyptians knew this was an issue, so they came up with what was probably the first underarm deodorant. Using nice herbs and other items that had pleasant aromas and stuck them where the odor was coming from. In ya bits. I just know that after a long day of hard labor in the sun, I would need more than cinnamon sticks and lavender to tame the odor of my sweaty lumberjack armpits. That's just how it goes. Number two, the Egyptian Brazilian. The 70s have come and gone, and a popular trend today is to be hairless everywhere. Even in places where you didn't think it was possible to grow hair when you were younger, Egyptians took it upon themselves to remove all their hair. Well, at least most of it. Not because the Nile River had nice beaches, but because of lice. Oh, yuck. While not an exact cure for the itchy bugs that plague schools across America, it did seem to help. And if you've ever had lice before, you know how bad that sucks. I had them once, it was the worst. She cut my hair, shaved, shaved my head, lots of baths. It's just, it's, it's no fun, man. I'm too cute for that, I don't want that. Number one. Wario breath. Wow. Okay. It makes sense that Egyptians would come up with breath mints and mouthwash. They fed their laborers diets of foods that contained a lot of onions and garlic. Sure, I'm just like everyone else who cooks. And when the recipe asks for one onion, eh, maybe I put in two. When it asks for two cloves of garlic, maybe I put in four. You gotta love that flavor. It was thought that they helped fight off disease and they were kind of right. However, after eating all that flavor, your breath would be something rancid. So herbs and mints were used to help quell the breath that could peel the paint off of walls. Thank God. At number 10, bloodletting. Back in the medieval age, medicine just wasn't the greatest. I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe, and even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, and I'm not sure I would really trust that. But back then, it was a case of you get what you get. So I guess people weren't complaining all that much about their barber Joey from down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was a practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent diseases or illnesses, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck blood out of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lances to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we don't do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside of my body. Thank you. At number nine, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the medieval ages might seem like a cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries that these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another. They had to worry about their bloodlines and of course, that thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably thinking, well, these kings aren't doctors, how did they cure illnesses? And to that I say, well, they touched it, of course. 
This whole thing started in the 11th century when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person that was suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and curing them. People thought that this was a miracle, and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness because monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Before we carry on talking about some of the bizarre medical practices from the medieval age, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. I number eight, toothworms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the medieval ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only because they had no proper medicine or anesthetics, but because you could also get the worst diagnosis you could ever get, a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth decay and pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, was the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to get rid of the worm would be to take a candle that was made of sheep's fat and various seeds, and they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run out from heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the person's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number seven, pee reading. Now this might not be considered a surgery, but this medieval age tradition was probably one of the strangest medical practices I have ever heard. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do this practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they knew how to judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working just fine. If it was wine colored like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that if your pee is wine colored, that's a bad thing. At number six, eye surgery. Our eyes are very sensitive, which is why it's so important to keep them healthy. Oftentimes when something is wrong with our eyes, we naturally go and get them fixed. But back in the medieval age, if something was wrong with your eyes, you really had to think long and hard about whether or not you really wanted to get them fixed because the procedure to fix your eyes sounded like an absolute nightmare. Back then when someone had cataracts, a surgical procedure called needling was performed and it involved having a doctor push a thick black needle into the patient's cornea. Remember, there was no anesthesia back then, so you were just raw dogging this entire experience. After the procedure was completed, the patient would usually be left with an unfocused eye, described to be similar to a camera without a lens. That didn't necessarily matter to everyone, because while it would be hard to read the Bible, it would still be okay to plow a field, and as long as they could work, that's really all that mattered. At number five, kidney stones. Now I can't say that I'm all that familiar with the way that kidney stones are treated these days, but I would assume that it is very different and not as terrifying as how they were treated back in the medieval age. After learning about this, I'm convinced that this could double as a form of torture. Basically how it went down is a physician's assistant would be sitting on top of you while you had your legs strapped to your neck. And then as the assistant was holding you, the doctor would stick two of his fingies up your little booty hole, press his fist against your pubes until he felt a hard pellet indicating a stone. After the diagnosis, then it would be removed through the bladder using a sharp instrument. Now I've never had a kidney stone, so I don't know how painful it is to have one, but for those who have experienced this, would you rather go through this medieval procedure or just tough it out until you pass the stone yourself? At number four, butt stuff. Even back in the medieval age, they had treatments for hemorrhoids. This illness was often associated with St. Fiaker, also referred to as the quote, patron of hemorrhoids. A 7th century tale said that this monk cured his illness by sitting on a sacred rock for several hours, and so in the medieval age, some physicians believed that the same method could apply to other people's butts. Obviously, that didn't work, so some other superstitious physicians came up with an alternate and more nightmare-inducing way of getting rid of hemorrhoids. If you didn't want to sit on a sacred rock for an extended period of time, you could always get a red-hot iron tube put up your butt. Yeah, I don't think it gets any worse than that. 
At number three, Belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, whatever you wanna call it, doesn't make it any less poisonous. This plant is one of the most toxic plants around, but that doesn't mean that people haven't tried to use it in their personal use. Normally, we want to stay away from toxic things like chemicals and X's, but back in the days of old, people said full scent and used belladonna as eye drops. Yeah, that's right. Even though this is literally poisonous, they thought, hmm, let's put it in our eyeballs. The organs that we use to see, because that's a bright idea, right? Many people, mostly women, used eye drops made out of deadly nightshade because it changed the size of their pupils to make them look more starry-eyed, and that was seen as a beauty trend. In moderation, these eye drops wouldn't really cause too much damage, but prolonged use of the poison could see some serious health concerns like stiff muscles, short-term memory loss, confusion, disorientation, and in some cases, death, because it could literally paralyze your heart. And if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad we don't do that anymore, then think again, baby, because if you've ever been to the optometrist and you've had your pupils dilated, guess what they use? That's right, belladonna. It's not harmful to put just a couple drops in your eyes and not to do it again for a while, but if you get your hands on it and start using it too much and in high dosage, then you're in for some trouble. At number two, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Yeah, I know, that doesn't really sound like fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it, and it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the medieval ages into the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders. This practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells shells, and in Europe, the procedure was done using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the medieval times and the Renaissance, trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times, the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been to try and fix damage from a head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest medieval surgery in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? Just got a hook for a hand. Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A 6th century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yeah, this man had a knife instead of a hand. This warrior had his hand amputated, however the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something and they just gave him the best that they could, and that was a knife as a placeholder, or if he just willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have a knife hand. But either way, that is so badass, and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Number 10, plastic surgery. Some celebrities you think are immortal when really it's just their plastic surgery that's fooling you. Unless you're Paul Rudd, he's definitely immortal. Sometimes it's obvious who's had it done, and sometimes it's really obvious who's gotten it done. Coming from the Greek term plastikos, which means to mold or to form, the oldest known plastic surgery took place in ancient Egyptian days. There's a medical text from the ancient Egyptian days that was named after the American Egyptologist who got it in 1862, and in it contains these ancient procedures. They look a little bit different from the shows we see today. You know, where it's like all these medical, we're gonna take this thing and put it into this guy's head. And you're like, how did they do that? This was a lot different. This is ancient procedures we're talking about. What procedure back then was to fix nasal injuries? This method used wooden splints, lint, swabs, and the first ever nose job was done. Even in 2000, a mummy was found with a prosthetic toe. So they asked volunteers to try walking with it to determine if it was created for purpose or for style. That's, that's nice. Here, try on this mummy's toe. Take a lap, see how you feel. Are you cursed? Plastic surgery in the sense of reconstruction, that first account comes from India in the sixth century. The Indian physician Sashruta Shamita is considered the father of plastic surgery. His patients were more interested in the cosmetic side effects, whereas the Egyptian practices were to fix the nose. Now around 500 BC, reconstructive surgery was done in India as well to reform noses that were cut off as a punishment. Number nine, broken bones. Sometimes a bone breaks and it needs immediate medical attention. Maybe a bone is pushing into a vital organ, maybe it's healing the wrong way, or maybe it's just a toe and you can't do anything about it but hobble around the house all day and learn new curse words as you mumble them and 
hobble. We all had that one friend in school who always had a cast on, or that blue finger restraint. There's always the one kid. But what happens if you broke your arm in the 1300s? Then what? Well, you wouldn't get any cool signatures from your cool friends, but what would happen is that they would use these blocks of wood and cloth. They'd just wrap everything around completely tight. Just the biggest cast possible. You actually could sign your name on this thing as many times as you wanted. I take that back. This thing was, you pretty much had a coffin around your leg, more or less. Number eight, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries, trepanation was the worst, that's for sure. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Turning the clocks back thousands of years, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory here is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's just drill holes into our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you would think. The reason that this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures. So you'd show up with a headache and then you'd leave with a hole in your head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is pretty surprising. They obviously didn't have advanced medical instruments. They would use any sharp instruments they could find, like rocks, flint, it was pretty rough. This was the first surgical procedure around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, which means means a borer to, you know, to drill essentially. Number seven, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extractions or whatever, but this for sure counts as surgery. Every time something gets removed from your body and there's blood, I'm gonna count that, sorry. I had to get a tooth pulled a few years ago and I'm still haunted by it. It is so barbaric the way they do it. They don't slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out. No, they had two dentists just grab my tooth at the same time, put their foot up and then just yank my tooth out. Not, like that was, the, the, we're still there, really? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem at all regarding your teeth. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later, tooth. Back in 5000 BC, a Sumerian paper referred to dental worms. So the earliest account of tooth decay, we think, unless, they were actual dental worms, in which case gross, but no, it was, you had a cavity. We're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology tell us now if the tooth's coming in sideways, but back then some believed it was always tooth worms, no matter what. If it hurts, yeah, it's worms, get them out. Imagine pulling your tooth out and being like, didn't find any worms. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry in 500 BC, and the way that they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw, so it was pretty horrible. If you go to the dentist now, just when you sit back and relax, you're sitting back and you're relaxing, that's it. The rest sucks, but these guys would stand up and just get Yang. Number six, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go down. There was lots of bloodshed, of course. There's animals and warriors and a lot of stabby stabbies. And crowds would rush the arena after the day was done, not to get autographs, but to hopefully get a sweet sip of that gladiator blood. Yeah, blood was considered a magical elixir back then. And then near the early 1500s, blood was then seen as youth juice. Yeah, if you drink some young blood as an elderly, those knees would just magically come back, apparently. Don't drink blood if you're watching this. Don't, unless you're Edward Cullen, don't drink blood. Team Jacob. Lots of theories surrounding blood in the Middle Ages. Bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought that your humors were out of balance. It was like, oh, you're sick? You just got some weird blood. We'll, we'll drain you out a bit. Vampires, all vampires. In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey, and that just absolutely changed the game. Now the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture, hypothetically. So we started to test this out on canines, of course. Scientists were injecting them with different substances, and slowly but surely that turned into blood transfusion between canines. So this is back in the 1660s. That's how early we started injecting things. Number five. Mummification. Mummification was common. Even today we're finding more mummies. We're uncovering more ancient history. But how the hell was mummification done back then? How was it done so well? We're talking about teeth worms and trepanation. How do ancient Egyptians figure this out? And how is it done in a way where the bodies are still reserved this long? Well, it wasn't cheap, I'll tell you that for free. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's pretty brutal, but what you would do is basically, you get a hook in your nose and all your brains would be pulled out. And then, they would cut the left side of your stomach, remove all those goods, all the organs, just bleh, gone, let those dry, yuck. And then you put the heart back in the body and then you wash the insides out with wine and spices over and over again, until eventually you cover the body in salt for 70 days, and around day 40, you gotta stuff it with sand. Come day 70, that's when you can wrap them in those mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits you, and so does the rest of your life. 
The jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber with the sarcophagus. So it was just a big room of yuck. Number four, cataract surgery. My brother was born with a cataract. This one's for you, homie. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book. Well, rather, in the painting. Found in a tomb in ancient Egypt was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. A little metal rod going into their eye. Just doing this makes me cringe. They believe this was a method called couching. This happened to be recorded. The needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time that it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. So they kind of were the OG couchers. It wasn't until 1747 until a doctor in France named Jacques Daviel, he performed the first cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. Every method, older, ancient, modern, it all sounds wildly uncomfortable. If you've been through this, kudos to you. Hit that like button, glad your eyes and stuff are working. Number three, transplantation. Blood transfusion is one thing, but how the hell do we figure out transplants? This arm, now over there on that guy? Hmm? The first successful one was in 1954 in Boston at the Peter Benton Brigham Hospital. That was like a surgical procedure. The first successful one, by any means, came from around 1000 BC. An Indian surgeon, Samhita, had written down details on how to transplant tissue from one of the body areas to repair nose injuries. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. But later on in the 16th century, that idea was revised. In Renaissance Italy in the 16th century, a man named Gasparo Tagliacozzi, and finally, French surgeon Alexis Carroll changed the medical game again in 1902 they published their work on the new techniques using new studies on animals and blood vessels and to this day that technique is still used. In 1904 they partnered with Charles Guthrie in Chicago and performed the first successful animal transplant saving the dog's life. So not that long ago, weirdly enough, had to include it. Number two, open heart surgery. We've discussed ancient Egyptians and how they would clean out the entire body and put the heart back in. Now of course they weren't alive during any of this, that body is long gone. But when was the first open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality? Well, the first successful open heart surgery went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. Now the surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, saved this man. And the city's first interracial hospital too. Lots of firsts happening in this one. There we go. There weren't any textbooks on this type of operation at the time, so the odds of survival were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all at this point. There were no x-rays, antibiotics, anesthesia, but also there was no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through the nerves, muscles, ribs, everything important, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, DC. Coming at number one, stitches. I'm gonna to totally jinx myself after this, but I've never broken a bone or gotten stitches in my life. I'm on a high alert now at all times. 27, not too bad. Many of my friends though, they've gotten stitches in their life. It's pretty common at this point. So I figured I'd cap this list off by going back to the origins of stitches. Going back to 3000 BC, once again, Egyptian literature, stitches were first made from plants, like hemp or cotton, or even animal tendons or animal arteries. Cat gut was the most common. That was a thread made of sheep intestines. One of the craziest ways of closing a wound was by using ants, believe it or not. Leaf cutter ants or army ants, they would be held against the opening, and then you wait for it to bite down, and once it does so, you would then remove the body, cut the head off, so the head of the ant is still stuck biting onto your cut, staying there until it heals. Imagine Ant-Man showing up to save the day and he just throws a pocket full of army ants. He's like, I'm here, I'm here to save you all. He just shows up, whips all the ants. He's like, there you go, you're healed. They're like, we didn't expect this at all. Please send somebody else, Ant-Man. Gross. 